stood to uh, face to face with Hitler to try to stop him. But if you look at the history, Antifa at the time was just the military wing of the communist German Communist Party, the KDP. And in fact, before Nazis took over Germany, they would sometimes team up with the not, uh, the, the fascist Nazi Party to fight against other uh, liberal groups uh, in Germany that they claim were also fascist. As a matter of fact, KDP and Antifa said that they were the only anti-fascist group. Everybody else was fascist. It's very much like today. Now, to be fair to modern Antifa, there's no direct connection between that Antifa and modern Antifa. That being said, that's it's the same way how modern neo-Nazis have no direct lineage to uh, German Nazis but they still share the same violent ideology, both neo-Nazis with German Nazis and both modern Antifa with the German Antifa of the time. And, but Antifa, modern Antifa actually comes from the 1980s and 1990s when there was a resurgence of the punk movement in both uh, uh, in, the, in the UK and here in America. This is kind of how I got involved. In the 1990s, Antifa, the skinhead movement and, and uh, the anarcho-punk movement were inseparable. When I was started getting involved in into this movement, this music movement, it was in 2009, and that's kind of how I got uh, roped into a lot of these different things. I would go to a show, I would meet people, they would invite me to protest, and then I just met more and more people. But that doesn't really talk about the tactics. What are their tactics? Well, everything that Antifa does can be boiled down to one thing, and it is called direct action. Direct action is the name of the game. And it is, means to directly take matters into your own hands to enact political change. It is a form of vigilante justice. Just as I said earlier, if things don't go for uh, in Antifa's way in a quote unquote democratic way, they're willing to use threats, intimidation, and violence to get their way. And in fact, there was a lot. This is something that I did <laughs> as, a, as an anarchist. I was a countless protest, again, um, many, I don't even know how many, but there was, I really wish that all I protested were Nazis because there were some incidents that probably shouldn't have done. To give you an example, uh, about a group of 10 or 15 of us, we went to Orange County once and we decided that uh, we didn't like the CEO because he was the head of a company that supposedly had a contract with a French airline to bring monkeys to America for animal testing. I don't know if that's true. That's just what someone told me. So we showed up in this guy's house every Sunday and we would yell nasty things to his face or rather to his window. We did this in broad daylight and in front of children. We didn't care. We'd yell the same nasty things that you'd hear Antifa yell at Nazis, calling him a fascist pig, saying that he should kill himself because he was an effing animal killer. The sad part, I mean, the funny thing is that he was never home. And the sad part is that we knew he was never home because the point of us showing up to this guy's house was never, never to have a conversation with him. It wasn't to sit down at the table, have, a, have an agreement, compromise, none of that. The purpose of us showing to his house and making a ruckus was for the neighbors. We were counting on the fact that when we left, the neighbors stayed behind and then they knew when he would come back. So we were hoping that they would go to his house and say, you need to leave this community because if you don't, you and I are gonna have problems. That's modern Antifa for you. But the mission of modern Antifa is to silence opposition through fear and intimidation. And in fact, Anarchists have a term for this type of political violence. It's called propaganda by the deed. Propaganda by the deed means to enact political violence against another with the intent and the hope that others will see this and be inspired and take up arms as well. And don't ever give in to the lie that Antifa is only fighting fascists because they are not. They are an anti-American and anti-liberty movement. And just back to Mark Bray's book, he writes that the, uh, at the heart of the anti-fascist outlook is a rejection of the classical liberal phrase, I disapprove of what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. After Auschwitz and Treblinka, 
anti-fascists committed themselves to fighting to the death the ability of organized Nazis to say anything. But he doesn't stop there. He continues by saying, thus, anti-fascism is an illiberal politics of social revolution applied to fighting the far right, not only literal fascists, but he doesn't stop there. Because if you keep reading the book, he talks about everyday fascists. What are everyday fascists? Well, he explains through, the, it's just people who hold quote unquote oppressive politics. Well, what is those oppressive politics? Well, people who are wearing socialism sucks shirts. If you are against socialism, one of the most dangerous ideologies in all of human history, all of a sudden you are a fascist that should be attacked and silenced. You, the modern Antifa is trying to silence the everyday fascists, which are just conservative and libertarian students. He, like many other anarchists, think that any hint of libertarianism or, or, or conservatism is the far right. And in fact, I used to share that idea. In 2011, again, I remember going to a, a, to a library, a, a bookstore in Pasadena. And I went to look, this is when I was starting to question conservatives and started really seeking out more information about them. And I asked the book attendant, I'm looking for books on radical politics. He responded, well, what are you thinking? Do you want to read some Marx or Egos? I'll find it for you. I responded, I'm looking for the Federalist Papers. The Federalist Papers were written by the founders, people who died for the cause of liberty. But according to Antifa, they are far right-wing radicals who should be feared. Antifa is so far left that any hint of libertarianism or conservatism or just liberty in general is the far right to them. Now, many of you may be wondering, how in the world did I end up leaving Antifa? I mean, that's kind of ridiculous. Not so much leaving, but becoming a conservative. But at the same time, I, would never, I never even thought I would ever join a movement like Antifa in the first place. And the truth is, it's really complicated. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I'm from a small town in Mexico. It's called Chimalhuacan. Have you ever tried to find it on Google? You probably won't find it. And it's probably because you can't spell it. But if you're able to spell it and find it, you'll find that it was nicknamed the trash can of Mexico City. This is the picture I found online. I lived among this. And thanks to coronavirus, I, I was home for a while. So I started looking to old photographs. So I found a couple of pictures of family pictures. On the left, you see that's right up outside my house. And look at the trash in the background. And on the right-hand side, it's a picture of my sister and myself. And if you look at the back, it's just a pile of trash. Here's a more modern picture. It is so much more beautiful, yet it still looks like trash. Have, if any of you ever seen the movie uh, Elysium with Matt Damon, it's set in a post-apocalyptic Los Angeles. But instead of going to the trashy parts of Los Angeles, they just went to my hometown. So I came to America when I was about nine. And I struggled with learning a new language. So a lot of the times I would watch Spanish TV, Telemundo, Univision, and a lot of the things that they peddle are just anti-American propaganda. But it didn't stop there. I was also in, uh, in school. I had multiple teachers in middle school and in high school who, instead of teaching me what they were supposed to, would stand in front of the classroom and lecture us about why we were stupid if we believed in God. That's specifically a biology teacher I had both in seventh grade and in 10th grade. So by the time I joined Antifa, I was already a prime candidate to join this anti-American movement. I mean, when I joined, when I started protesting Nazis, I thought that America stood with them. Why else would police officers defend a Nazi's right to free speech? I didn't understand at the time that it's a much more complicated issue. It's not black and white. And if we don't protect the rights of everyone, that's only going to hurt our republic and our democracy, because then you give the government the power to silence you. Yet another problem with Antifa is their demand for loyalty. 
for example, in 2012, when I started asking questions, it was because I was introduced to Milton Friedman and Thomas Sowell, two great economists who I find incredibly interesting, but I, I didn't agree with them. I thought they were interesting, but whatever. So I started going and I started reading books. Uh, as a matter of fact, I have a little book here that again, because of Corona, I started going through my old stash. It's called The Accumulation of Freedom. And in one of the pages, I found one of my, one, some of my uh, old annotations about how I'm questioning a lot of the ideas that they had here uh, based on these two gentlemen. But I didn't find answers in books, so I started trying to talk to more people. And of course, the people who were interested in my stories or basically my politics were other members of Antifa. And you know, for being an anarchist at the time, that was the very first time that it was called a capitalist pig. Because as soon as I started asking questions, I became the enemy. I started being harassed and I just decided, you know what, I'm not gonna talk to you guys because I don't want to be like you. Luckily, at this, around this time, I was starting college. So I decided to start a Young Americans for Liberty chapter, which is thanks to the Leadership Institute that uh, Adam Weinberg, who helped me at the time. And the reason I started a Young Americans for Liberty chapter as opposed to a general political club is because there was already political clubs on campus, yet there was no conservatives there. You have to find the libertarians and the conservatives and draw them out. So I started, even though I didn't agree with everything that y'all had to say, I started one so I could talk to more libertarians. It was thanks to them that they convinced me over time to become a libertarian. But it's funny because even though I wasn't a libertarian when I joined, I started the club, as soon as people found out I was part of a right-wing club, people hated me. And it's it we received harassment from administration time and time again we lost our advisor multiple times just to give you an example our fifth advisor he told us that the administration continually told him that if he wanted a future with the school he would uh, stop being our mentor and we were incredibly lucky because he was a conservative a libertarian as well so he believed in our cause you know, it's a college club. So a lot of the activism we did was both, some of it was uh, uh, serious. We talked about national debt or NSA spying, but some of it was just about campus politics. One time I decided to, uh, we all decided to protest the student government and we decided to like call them a bunch of communists just to like satirical. And I knew that a lot of them liked My Little Pony. So I created a little collage from some stuff I found that looked a little like this. It's not important. I mean, it's just, two pictures put together. That's all I did. We stood with a big sign right outside uh, the student gover government office and that angered them. The student government uh, off, uh, advisor walked out and she took a picture of the sign. She took a picture of us. She documented the whole area. And then I, I went up to her and I asked her, well, it's pretty funny, right? She just responded, well, we'll see what the lawyers have to say about this. She was threatening to sue me for something that I knew was 100% protected by the First Amendment. And even though my speech was satirical, it's, I would win in court, it felt like the First Amendment didn't apply here. And in fact, we were incredibly lucky because they forgot to copyright their own logo. So they had absolutely no case against us. But at that time we decided, you know what? we need to do something about this. We contacted, uh, we looked online to, for uh, legal groups that could help us. And we found the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, which is a great legal group out of Philadelphia. Um, if you, by the way, I should say, if you are a conservative student that is facing uh, legal challenges or anything, any uh, liberal bias, let me know because I'll connect you with a legal group to make sure, and I'll help you fight it back because that's really what we needed when I was in school, somebody to help us fight against uh, the administration. But when we filed suit, it was a painful few months. It's not pretty. People hated us even more. And that still persists to this day. About a year after everything ended, uh, I was ready to graduate and there was an administrator at an event who shook my hand. And instead of saying like, thank you, you know, we'll miss you something, she'll just say, well, we won't miss you. It was a painful few months when we filed suit. 
but somehow we ended up winning. And the sad part is that that was the second time within nine years that they had been sued for the exact same thing. I really wish I got the $110,000, but lawyers are expensive and they work pro bono. Nonetheless, we never did it for the money. We did it to change their policies and change campus culture on campus. We removed a lot of their unconstitutional policies. Now, as I mentioned, I've been an activist for about 10 years now, six, almost seven now. I've been a conservative. But what happened to me in a tiny community college is happening to countless of conservative students across the nation. I want to give you a few different examples. This is UC Berkeley, February 1st, 2017. By any means necessary, decided to organize a protest because a conservative club wanted to bring a conservative speaker. Well, that turned into a riot and it cost Northern Californians $100,000 in property damage. But let me show you a video, a more recent video from uh, Binghamton University, where a group of four or five conservative students were tabling, just talking about their ideas. Well, that prompted this. Now, of course, five people showing up. So, sorry that there was no sound in the video. Um, sorry about that. But what you can see is a mob of 200 leftist activists who decided to show up. And they, they just started harassing them, yelling at them. This woman who you see on the screen said that you're white. Therefore, I don't care about what you believe. But unfortunately, this is not something that this is something that we see commonly. It's how the first time I saw it was at California State University Northridge, where my friend decided to hold a sign, which led to a hundred leftist activists surround him, and the and the campus security was forced to walk him to his car because they fear for his safety. But it's happened at Kansas State University, at Pennsylvania, and also in Sacramento State University. Unfortunately for Sacramento, they also they also experience violence on on their campus. I'm sorry if you can't hear this. Basically, the student, the conservative student is asking him, what, what have I done? And he's saying, like, you're harassing me. And now here, he's yelling that Emma, that mother effing, oh, you're dead. You're going to end up dead. Just for being a conservative student, this is what kind of what you're, you'll expect if you decide to speak out on campus. But it's not the first time, and it's unfortunately not the last time that we've seen political violence. Last year, many of you may remember this incident at UC Berkeley, where Hayden Williams was punched in the face. And why? You may wonder. The reason that punch happened was because Hayden decided to hold up a sign that said, hate crime hoaxes hurt real victims. But it'd be one thing if these things were random occurrences. One incident here, one incident there. But that's not what's happening. There is hundreds of incidents just like this one. But it's coming from somewhere. It's not in a vacuum. There's professors who are encouraging this type of behavior. I already mentioned Mark Bray, but there's also this like people like this professor from Colorado State University who vowed that she was uh, vows to punch political opponents in the neck. But there's also people like this guy right here whose name is Dwayne Dixon from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. He is the leader of his chapter of the Redneck Revolt. Just to give you a measurement of what the Redneck Revolt is, because I mentioned them earlier in, in that screen, they are a self-proclaimed Antifa group. 
And when a reporter, Kamal Bell from CNN, said that uh, they had a mini interview with them and called them the good guys. He interviewed four people, and among them was this guy named Rob Sprosen or Van Sprosen. And a few weeks later, he was the one who started firebombing a nice facility in Washington, and he was shot dead by officers. He's supposed to be the good guy, according to the left. But Kamal Bell is not the only reporter. For example, last year, when there was protest outside of Mitch McConnell's house, calling for his bloody murder, saying murder Mitch, Chris Hayes, from MSNBC had Eli Misto, and, and Chris Hayes said, oh, there were peaceful protests. Well, Eli Misto took it a step further and saying, no, I wanna see more of this. I wanna see people with march with pitchforks and torches outside of the homes of Trump supporters or Trump donors. But of course, this is not the only time. The media thinks, the left-wing media thinks that Antifa is on their side, but Antifa doesn't care. If you start criticizing them or trying to find out the truth, you become an enemy, such as what happened to Andy Nell. Of course, this incident, instead of people saying like how dare Antifa attack him, well, a professor at the University of Wisconsin Whitewater had the audacity to say Antifa is the form of self-defense after Andina was attacked. Hurting reporters and inciting riots and firebombing Washington, uh, uh, an ICE facility, is nothing even remotely close to self-defense. Yet professors sit in their ivory tower and think that they are above hatred, above, above ill will, but they are not. They are spreading an anti-conservative bias, and it is hurting real people. Since this incident, of course, Antifa has been, a, has been intimidated and, you know, but before that, let me tell you a story about, um, there's this guy named, I forget his name, but he, Mark Bray talks about him in his book, and it's just to highlight how bad fascists are. Uh, Emilio, his name is, I think his name is, he says that Emilio in the 1920s was, the, was named the, the leader of his local socialist chapter in Italy. Well, after the Mussolini's fascists found out about, about him, they went to his house, and they pulled him out in the middle of the night, beat him to a pulp, and they told them, if you don't leave, we're coming for your family. And of course, this is, this, is, this is despicable. We should never tolerate that kind of behavior. But let me ask you the, that question. What is the difference between those Mussolini's fascists and these Antifa activists who decided to show up outside of, of Andy No's house to intimidate him with a cutout of his face? There's one difference. The only difference is that in modern America, and thanks to capitalism, we have systems like a security system who takes cameras and a better improved uh, police force that deters criminal activity. But had Andy No been in, uh, in Mussolini's time, Antifa would have done the exact same thing. Antifa is not fighting fascism. They are the fascists. But unfortunately, it doesn't stop with professors and it doesn't stop with the media. There's also professors who support and defend Antifa's conduct, such as Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Well, when Boston Antifa started beating up a bunch of people at a, at a peaceful pro protest, well, she started fundraising to bail them out of jail. But she's not alone. We also have people like Representative Asia Gomez from Minnesota, who was seen with Antifa as Antifa was throwing bottles, uh, glass bottles at Trump supporters. But it's not just a couple of congressmen. We also have Representative Keith Ellison, the former vice chairman. At the time, he was a vice chairman of the Democratic Party. And you see him here standing with this violent manifesto. And I really wish I could say a former, as in he's no longer in office. but. He got a promotion. 
He's now the attorney general from Minnesota. And Keith Ellison, again, he was the vice chairman of the Democratic Party. He wasn't some random professor. He wasn't some random elected official. He is one of the leaders of the Democratic Party. And here we see him standing and posing with this violent manifesto. Antifa is not some boogeyman. It is a real threat. And we have to take them seriously because there's three groups that are promoting conservative, uh, anti-conservative bias and they're leading to violence against libertarians and conservatives. First is the professors, who colleges and professors who are cultivating this type of violent ideology in the classroom. But second, it's the mainstream media who's promoting it. But lastly, it's politicians who defend and justify the violence. You know, I seldom talk about my story, but I've been inclined to do it much more because I've seen the increase of Antifa. And President Barack Obama has an, uh, uh, he said something in the last year of his presidency that I just love. He said, feel free to disagree with somebody, but just don't try to shut them up. I think the problem in modern politics is that we forgot just to be decent people, just to be decent. I've been a, an activist for about 10 years. And the one thing I can tell you that I've learned is that the way we, we, we bridge the political divide is to just treat one another as a person would treat another person because we are people, not political pawns. I'll tell you one last story. And this one comes from CPAC. I was uh, at CPAC and I was interviewed by this gentleman named Joe Thomas. He has a radio show in Charlottesville, Virginia. Right before his interview, I spoke to his wife and what she told me was amazing. She said that her husband was at the Charlottesville riot in a few years ago, I think in 2017 it might've been. And the reason she, he went was because he's a journalist and he wanted to cover the issue so nobody would tell him about it. He, was, he wanted to be a firsthand witness. Well, just for being white, Antifa attacked him. They threw pee on him, doused them with pepper spray. And in one incident, there was an Antifa activist who was ready to beat him. And then someone stopped it. A gentleman named Hawk Newsom from um, Brooklyn. And he was the, uh, he's the leader of the Black Lives Matter chapter in Brooklyn. Why would Hawk Newsom do something like that? I mean, he's a leftist activist, he's supporting Antifa, what's going on? Well, Joe's wife told me that she, her, his, her husband, Joe and Hawk Newsom met once at another political rally. And at that rally, he interviewed him just like any other person. But after the interview, they just talked for about, 10, for about an hour and they didn't talk about politics. All they did was talk about coffee and talk about just their lives. That was enough. That brief conversation was enough for Hawk Newsom to put his hand his, uh, on, on Joe's shoulder and say, not him, he's cool. This is what we have to do to bridge a political divide. We have to forget that somebody else has other types of politics. We just have to treat them as Hawk Newsom and Joe Thomas treated the, uh, each other for that one hour, just as people. You know, the crazy thing, I wasn't even 18 when I did all these things. I wish I could go back and apologize to that CEO. I wish I could apologize to uh, the people's uh, windows that I broke. I'm glad that I never got into a fight while I was in Antifa because that would torment me. I don't like hurting other people. But thankfully, modern society and our society judges you on the person that you are today, not at the person that you once was. So today, my job is to help conservative and libertarian students defend themselves and protect themselves against liberal bias and against Antifa because I know exactly how they operate. But more than that, I want to be a person just like Hog Newsom and Joe Thomas were at that point. Somebody who's just willing to talk about life and to connect with other people and forget about politics. You know, there's a common joke about first year psychology students that say that uh, they think they know the whole world of human behavior because they took a, an introductory course to psychology or, or sociology 101. I think that's what's happening with college campuses. As my mom once told me, 
some people, they become so educated that they just start acting stupid in their self-righteousness. Well, for a lot of you, you're only in college. And once you're out of college, you're going to be in, in just going to be in life. You're going to make a lot of mistakes. I made a lot. But don't let the one mistake in your life be silence another's right to free speech. Thank you, and I'll take any questions. Awesome. Thank you, Gabe. Thank you for sharing, uh, you know, your story and how you're conservative now. And thank God you're conservative now because I, I know you personally and you're one smart guy. Um, so I, I would rather have you on my side than, than the other side. Um, so uh, with that being said, we'll, we'll move into questions. And I will remind everybody, we already have a few uh, lined up, which is awesome. But I want to remind everybody uh, to actually ask the questions. Uh, it, at the bottom, again, I'll remind you at the bottom, there is a Q&A icon. And you can just go ahead and type your question in there, and then we will address it. But uh, Gabe, I'll start off first. Uh, we have a student who is an, actually an executive for a Turning Point chapter at UNLV. Um, and he says that he personally witnessed people come to their table and destroy their stuff and protest. Uh, he's also heard stories and even seen videos of uh, people who were, were physically attacked uh, on, within their group, but the police never did anything about it. So if a group member was in, put in that situation where they were attacked, on campus, uh, they reported it to the campus police, but nothing was ever done. But they also have vi video evidence uh, with some things that they can do. So there's a couple of different things that you can do, but the one thing that you need to do, and I think you mentioned it, is to be ready to film. Because a lot of times I've had students be attacked, all of this kind of uh, behavior occur, and the police doesn't want to do anything. And not because the police officers don't want to do anything because they are more than willing to arrest people, but administrators don't want to deal with it. So it's very difficult to, uh, to get away with it if you have video evidence. So it's probably one of the best things that you can do. Now, if, um, if it's pretty egregious, hopefully we can bring attention to it through uh, websites like Campus Reform and, mm -hmm. and uh, other means. And I will personally like contact you if you, well, if you contact me, I'll, I'll help you how to, uh, how to defend yourself against it. But in general, I think that you need to document as much evidence as possible and put the pressure on the university because they're not gonna do anything until we demand them to enforce their, the rights of students and to protect conservative and libertarian students. Yeah, well said, well said. And again, he, he mentioned, and I mentioned in his intro, he is our student's rights advocate. Uh, so if you have any issues that come up like this, uh, feel free to reach out to Gabe, and uh, his email is right there. We can help you through. Okay, our friend uh, Woodrow Johnson actually wants to ask you a personal question uh, when it came to your time in Antifa. Did you ever use any violence against conservatives that you knew were conservative? Um, no, and then I, I like to add on a little bit. What If you did, was this something that Antifa encouraged you to do, and that's why you did it? No, uh, I've never, uh, as I mentioned at the end of the speech, uh, closer to the end, I'm thankful that I never actually did that. That being said, I did go to some pretty tumultuous rallies that it was, it's not as an effect, it's, inc it's not encouraged as much as it is uh, kind of expected of you. If you're rolling with the pack, you're one of them. So all of a sudden, if somebody's getting beat up, somebody's getting into a fight, well, you have to jump in. It's kind of a mob mentality. There's one incident when I remember at a, a, at a protest, there was uh, uh, one of them, one of them, my friends putting it, getting arrested pretty close to me and two people right in front of me, they kind of looked around, they, didn't, they saw the police officer on his own. So they went up to him, they, they pushed him and one of them punched them in the face. They picked up my friend and they all went back to the black block. That's kind of how it works. You, when you're there, if it comes down to it, you're expected to do it. Mm, it's like a gang mentality. Yeah. Um, okay, so Alyssa Jones from Virginia Tech, uh, she's a great student there. She wants to know, do you have any advice uh, for bringing awareness to these issues on a more apolitical or apathetic campus? Well, uh, surprisingly, almost every single uh, campus in America is apolitical. You'd be very surprised. Um, yeah, there's a lot of liberal clubs on campus, uh, but that, they're a minority of the, how many students are actually involved. Students in general, they're apathetic. So the best way to get them involved is to actually start conservative clubs or libertarian clubs and do activism, show, show that you're out there. For example, when I started a conservative club, there was nobody there. The conservatives were there, but uh, I needed to fish them out. And the way I fished them out was by standing there with a clipboard. 
and just talking to people, doing activism events. And then eventually uh, the first meeting was really small. I remember having 30 people and I was really discouraged, but I was like, okay. And then next semester, all of a sudden my first meeting I had like 26 students, mm -hmm. 27 I think students show up and they were all interested in getting ready to, to really talk about, uh, uh, about conservatism, which is great. Um, so almost every single campus in America is apathetic. It is your job to just start a club and host events and host me if you want. I'll, I'd love to go on campus and uh, just get them involved because otherwise they're just going to go to class and then go home. Yep, yep, he nailed it. Um, also, uh, to add on to that as well, if you visit leadershipinstitute.org, you can find your regional field coordinator uh, and they can help you become more active on campus with speakers, grants, and other activism resources. Uh, okay, so I don't know where this student is uh, asking the question from or what campus they're from, but uh, they said the young democratic socialist is rising is a rising force on their campus. Uh, do you think they could be potentially violent like Antifa? Um, I don't want to speak about any particular uh, one. What I can tell you is that I'm not the only person who's left Antifa. There was this person from Michigan who I spoke to on the phone for at length for a while, and she told me that she was also an Antifa and she became a conservative. She has a very surprisingly similar story to mine. She joined the Young Democratic Socialists and everybody was in Antifa. They protest Ben Shapiro at one specific incident. And, sorry. Oh, sorry, there's a notification. And they did all of these different things. Eventually, they, she started having original thoughts, so they chastised her. Um, so I don't want to say that all of YDS chapters are like that, because they're not. There's some people who are socialists and they're peaceful, and I've met socialists who are wrong, but, <laughs> well, I believe they're wrong, but at the same time, they're very kind people. Uh, and in fact, to give you an example, in the Hayden video, when he was being punched, there's a student mm -hmm. who's trying to stop it. Mm -hmm. I forget his name and I feel bad, but he's a very nice gentleman. He's a socialist and he just stops by at Berkeley and just talks to us every time we were on campus. Uh, I don't know if he was part of YDS, but right. there's the potential for it because they run with those circles, but I don't think that everybody in YDS is violent. Got it. Um, and we actually have, we have an anonymous student uh, that, that wants to ask you, what kind of backlash have you received from your former colleagues or members uh, at Antifa when you changed sides? Well, the reason that I, when I changed sides, it's not like I did it all like, I'm a conservative. Yeah. What I did was in 2012, when I like, I was done. Right. And I was just hanging out for about, like, you know, I did activism, but it was very low key on college campuses for about three years. And then in 2017, when I saw the rise of Antifa, I wrote an op-ed. And then people were kind of questioning me about it. And I just mm -hmm. was like, I don't want any of the attention. And now if the people who I ran with, they probably aren't even involved in politics anymore because a lot of them tend to be younger in the college age. So I don't even know if any of them actually paid attention to me. Yeah. All the modern people... I've, I've been thankful that I haven't received any nasty things or anything, but um, yeah, I, I I just, I was so far disconnected from them when I finally became out as, like, as an open conservative, because even my time with the Leadership Institute, a lot mm -hmm. of my activism was very, very like low key. It was only since last year that I started going on Fox and started writing more that I be, really became out there. So thankfully I haven't received anything. Hopefully I never I was going to say, since, since you became out there, you haven't received anything since then? For well, from former colleagues. Correct. That being said, sometimes I do get like nasty things, or you know, Got it. I'm a conservative activist. So uh, there's one time I used to be Davis. There was this guy who tried stealing our things for one of my events, and he like pushed me. You know, yeah. uh, you still experience that kind of things like it's a conservative, but no one from my like my former colleagues. Yeah, understand. Okay, so Skylar, I may get your name wrong, uh, but we have Skylar Washman. I'm gonna say. Uh, they're actually, a, she or she or he is a chapter chairman at the Young Conservatives of Texas at Texas Tech. So uh, thank you for joining and, and recruiting for this event. But um, they want to know, do you think there's any way uh, to have claim uh, an actual rational conversation with a member of Antifa as a conservative? Well, well you have to be very, very careful. Um, I would never advise you to, if you see like a, a black block, which is when they're all in like a black mask and everything, yeah. I would never go up to them and be like, hey, how's it going? Just like I wouldn't go up to a neo-Nazi with a rally and say, what's up, dude? <laughs> that being said, you have to catch them off guard. 
um, one of my favorite activism events, a lot of people are doing it, it's the change my mind kind of uh, things. Um, I did one in, in what was it, in Massachusetts, and there was this guy who's quote unquote self-proclaimed uh, member of Antifa who stopped by and we had a conversation for about two hours probably less it was cold <laughs> but for about an hour um and you know we just had a conversation and he even though he says that he's part of antifa we were just connecting us one another kind of like going bouncing off ideas um you kind of have to pick your battles and know when to do it uh my recommendation is to reach out if you're a conservative club on campus reach out to the YDS, to the LGBT club, to the, um, I don't know, whatever other liberal club there is, not to have debate, which you can have, but say, hey, we're having an end of the year pizza party. You guys wanna come? Building that bridge. Yeah, yeah, build that bridge first and then talk about politics rationally. Yeah, Uh, okay, so we're only gonna do a couple more questions and then we're gonna gonna wrap this up by telling you a little bit more about events coming up. Uh, But the next question uh, I have from Layla, uh, I, I guess I'm saying that right, but uh, she didn't say what campus she was from, but it's a turning point. She's a turning point USA president uh, on a very left leaning campus um, and their activism is usually blocked or destroyed and rumors about their chapter actually deter people from attending their meetings. Um, what can she do when she's in that position? First of all, don't give up because it's painful. So, I mean, I remember experiencing the same, same type of bias, but don't give up because eventually our ideas will win. I'm very confident of that. That being said is um, a couple of different things. If you think it's the administration, document it. You have to document it and try to find if there's a pattern. And if you think that there's a pattern, start asking other political clubs, both conservative and both liberal, if they experience the same type of, uh, of uh, you know, problems or oh glitches or mistakes if you can kind of establish that pattern you can contact me and hopefully we can look at get an attorney to look at it and maybe bring suit or maybe just a demanding letter um it, they're getting very sneaky because yeah. about eight years ago it was pretty clear all these professors but now they're very they're aware that we're watching so they're trying to hide their things. So it's all about documenting a pattern of abuse and hopefully we can, uh, it's enough to show a court that uh, this pattern exists. Got it. Um, okay, so last question. Uh, Gabriel from uh, California State University. Uh, th- she wants to know, uh, how, do you, how do you get conservative students on campus to become more politically involved? Uh, they've met with conservative students that are scared to show they're actually conservative. So how do you get them involved uh, even though they're scared to become, you know, actively conservative out loud. Well, that can be difficult. I've met some people that uh, I've, at multiple different universities, Berkeley, California State University, San Luis Obispo, uh, Cal, Cal State LA, just a lot of schools. I've had students come up to me talking and just saying, hey, I support you guys. I asked them to sign up. They say, no, I don't want my name on your list. I'm afraid of it. And that can be very disheartening. And unfortunately, there's some people that you're just not going to be able to reach because they're just very afraid. What I would recommend saying, look, we're all here. We're all part of the solution. Kind of join us and just show how they're not alone. There's so many people out there. But if they really don't want to be, put them in the email list or try to send them a message every so often. But what you really want to look for are those people who are ready to get involved because then you can work a lot more with them and get them to recruit for a lot more other events. Thanks so much for watching this video. To watch our latest video, click here. And to make sure you don't miss any future videos, be sure to subscribe.